Well, good morning and welcome to the Court Street United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Jeremy Peters. Today I'm coming to you from the sanctuary in downtown Flint. We are so glad that you are here. We're glad that you took the time to worship with your Court Street Church family this morning. We want you to know that God loves you and there is nothing that you or anyone else can do about it. God loves you as you are. God is with you where you are as you join your church family in online worship this morning. We pray that as we worship together today, you would feel God's presence and, and that you would receive God's love in the things that we say and do and hear this morning. Now today is a very special day in the life of the church. Today is, is one of those especially holy days, a, a day we set aside for a, a particular celebration each year. Today is the day when we celebrate All Saints Day. All Saints Day is one of my favorite church traditions. You know, early on in the life of the Christian faith, there came to be a, a tradition of remembering the saints who had passed. Usually saints who, who had passed would be remembered on, on the day of their death, on the anniversary of their death. You know, many of these saints in the early days of the church died in a way that, that revealed their faith and strengthened the faith of other people. And so on the anniversary of their death, the church family would gather together and would tell the story of how these saints died and how they lived as a way of, of celebrating God's presence and the promise of resurrection. And so it came to be that you had Saint so-and-so's day and, and the feast day of Saint such-and-such. And after a few centuries of celebrating some of the most significant and important and well-known saints in the church family, somebody had a really, really good idea. Somebody said, why don't we set aside a day for all of the other saints? Why don't we set aside a day for celebrating all of those saints of the church who will never get their face in a stained glass window, those people who will never have a, a church named after them? Why don't we set aside a day for celebrating those saints who quietly and faithfully lived, lived next to us in the pews and, and shaped our faith. Those people who were our grandparents and parents in faith. Those people who ate with us at the table of the Lord. Those people who sang hymns with us. Those people who, who taught our Sunday school classes and, and shaped who we've come to be. Why don't we set aside one day for celebrating all of those saints who are dear to us personally. And so that's what we're gonna to do today. Today we're gonna to give thanks for all of those people who have brought us closer to God, the people who have inspired us and shaped our faith, the people who are now resting in God's presence, who we hope to see again on the day of resurrection. As we celebrate today, we're gonna to sing some, some hymns, one of them which we always, always sing on All Saints Day. Today we're gonna to begin with, with hymn number 711. If you've got a United Methodist hymnal at home, go ahead and turn to number 711 if you wanna see the music. Later on in worship, we'll sing number 555. So today we'll sing 711 and 555. All right, church, I invite you to take a moment and, and think of those saints those people who are resting now in God's presence, who shaped your faith, who inspired you. Take a moment as we sing this first hymn to thank God for them and to celebrate their life and their witness. Take a deep breath, church, and let's approach God with a song.
Well, today in worship, we're gonna do something that connects us with generations of saints who came before us. The Apostles' Creed goes back to the earliest days of the Christian faith. It's a, a way of telling the story of God's love and remembering where we come from and who we are. At the, at the close of the Apostles' Creed, we say these words. We say, I believe in the communion of saints. And when we say those words, this is what we're, we're saying. This is what we mean. We mean we believe that God's love is more powerful than death, which means that God's family, the church, can never be broken or divided or separated by death. It means that we are still connected to all of the saints who came before us, that they are still part of the church with us and that even as we are worshiping God today, they are worshiping God alongside us. And so as we say these words today, I invite you to imagine surrounding you wherever you are, those saints who worshiped with us in the pews in days gone by. Imagine a great cloud of witnesses, thousands of saints saying these words in thousands of languages, saints from all through the ages who are joining us in worship as we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, now I wanna say good morning to the kids who are worshiping with us today. Hello, kids. We are so glad that you are worshiping with your church family today with all of these people who love you. I love you. God loves you. We miss you. We hope that you're doing well and enjoying all of the fall things that are happening right now. All right, come on up close to the screen because it's time for another story with Pastor Christie. Hi, friends. It's Pastor Christie. I'm sorry I can't be with you this week. I miss you so much. My friend Reverend Mary has a special story for us today. I hope you enjoy it. I love you and Jesus loves you too. As we just experienced in our worship service about All Saints Sunday, all those saints that have gone on before us, those who have taught us in so many ways, showed us how to love, and um, all those wonderful things show us how to do good and be kind. So I thought I would read this book to you. And it's called A Little Blue Bottle. It's written by Jennifer Grant. And it's illustrated by Jillian Whiting. It's published by Church Publishing, and this is a brand new book. It just came out this year in 2020. Let's begin. Mrs. Wednesday died last Thursday, or maybe the week before. All I know is ever since then, nothing feels the same anymore. They loaded Mrs. Wednesday's furniture onto a truck and they drove it far away. Her daughter picked up Mural, the ginger cat. Now Mural lives some other place. Mural used to hide under Mrs. Wednesday's bed until I'd come and find her. She purred loud and low from underneath the bedspread. I remember when Mr. Wednesday died. My mama says to me, it was before you were even born. Mural was his cat, I tell her. Mrs. Wednesday told me that. They were married 60 years, mama says. She was very sad when he died. 
I feel sad, I tell her. She lived next door to me my whole entire life. Mama smooths my hair away from my face. Did you ever notice that blue bottle on the windowsill, she asks, right above her kitchen sink? I remember. There were always three things on that shelf. A little blue bottle, African violets with dark purple flowers and fuzzy leaves and a picture of Mr. Wednesday in a silver frame. Not long after Mr. Wednesday died, she and I were having a cup of tea, Mama says. She had just bought that little blue bottle and she took it out and showed it to me. There's a verse in the Bible that says that God knows when we cry and saves every one of our tears in a bottle, Mama says. Sometimes over the years, she told me that when she was missing Mr. Wednesday or just felt lonely or was having a hard day, she held that little blue bottle and imagined God was collecting her tears in it, Mama says. I try to imagine my tears falling into a blue bottle and God saving them, every single one. And I wonder if it could be true. Mama, sit closer, I say, reaching for her hand. And as she slides over close and puts her arm around me, she doesn't say anything at all. Mrs. Wednesday died last Thursday, or maybe the week before. All I know is ever since then, nothing feels the same anymore. Psalm 56 Verse eight says, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. I wonder what it might look like if you are sad or you're thinking of someone you've had to say goodbye to. If you had a little bottle Maybe it could be a bottle like this, one that you could put your tears in. You know, a friend of mine once told me that tears are liquid love. It's our love that pours out of our eyes and helps us sometimes to feel a little better. And when we bottle those all up, we know that God is holding us dear and close and holds us when we are sad. And it's okay to be sad too when we say goodbye. Let's pray. Dear gracious God, hold us close. Let our tears flow for the love to be coming from us. We miss our friends. We miss our family. Hold us close and let us never forget the memories of our loved ones. In your son's name we pray, amen. Well, now we've come to that time in our worship when we approach God in a moment of prayer. And today as we gather in prayer, there are so many things that we could be praying about. And today I'm praying for those people in our church family who have lost loved ones in the last 12 months. And today I'm also praying for three congregations not far from us who are, are grieving the loss of their pastor this morning. As I'm filming this today, we've just learned the, that our friend, our colleague, Pastor Kay Lytelt, pastor of Otisville United Methodist Church, West Deerfield United Methodist Church, and Fostoria United Methodist Church, 
has passed away. She died of complications related to COVID. We pray for the people in those congregations who are, are grieving her death and for her children and grandchildren, for her family and friends. We pray for the people who have been affected by the close to a quarter million lives that have been lost because of the coronavirus in the last few months, the more than a million lives lost around the world. We pray for peace in our communities and in this nation as, as an election, a national presidential election draws near. Maybe today you wanna pray for one or all of these things. Maybe today you're carrying something on your heart that's, that's personal to you. In this moment, as Ryan Pratt leads us, I invite you to have whatever conversation you need to have with God this morning, to hear whatever words you need to hear from God this morning, and to receive peace in such a difficult moment, the peace that only God's Spirit can give. Good morning, Court Street family. Let's pray together. Dear God, we come before you today in prayer. God, with the election coming up, we pray again that you would work for the good of the nation, and we pray that you would bring unity with this election and help us all to work together for the greater good. We pray that you would keep everyone involved in local, state, and federal elections healthy and safe, and keep everyone who is voting safe as well. We pray that you would help us to remember the many saints that have come and blessed our lives and spread your word during their lives, God. We thank you for the wonderful influence so many saints have had in their churches and communities. God, we pray this morning that you would show us the ways that you have been walking by us. Remind us and show us the times you have helped us get through and help us remember that we're not alone and we never will be when we have you in our heart. We pray today for an overwhelming sense of peace, God. Help us feel your touch of serenity that you provide through your Holy Spirit. And we pray that this peace would remain with us in this pandemic season. God, we thank you for the many blessings that you've given us and the many saints that you have worked through in their time. We pray that one day you would have us meet these saints with you in heaven in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A lot of things have changed in the last seven months. But we believe the mission of the church remains the same. We believe that God has called us to create a world with more peace and more hope by loving one another as Jesus loves us. One of the ways that we do that at Court Street United Methodist Church is by partnering with ministries and organizations in our community that are doing God's work among our, our neighbors. Last week, we, we participated in an event with one of our ministry partners. We celebrated Night Without a Bed to help raise awareness of homelessness in our community and support the work of Family Promise in Genesee County. Thank you so much, everyone who spent the, the last Saturday night without a bed. Thank you to everyone who made a gift to Family Promise. I am so, so proud of this church family for the way that it rallies in moments like this to, to support important work and to be part of what God is doing in our community. This week we're gonna give you another invitation, another, another opportunity to work with one of our ministry partners to reach out in God's love to this community. Now we're approaching Thanksgiving and every year at Thanksgiving, our friends at Crossover Downtown Outreach Ministry make sure that nobody in our neighborhood, nobody in our community celebrates Thanksgiving without turkey and all of the trimmings on the table. They wanna make sure that Thanksgiving is a moment of feasting and celebration that everyone in our community can take part in. And so they, they gather lots of Thanksgiving foods in the, in the days and the weeks before Thanksgiving. And they've invited us to be a part of this. They've invited us to help them by, by donating and dropping off some of the foods that, that they need the most right now. And so we have set up three dates, three times, November 10th, November 12th, and November 16th. And you're gonna see in just a second, now you're seeing the days and the times of these drop-offs on your screen. We've set up three opportunities for you to swing by the church, pull through the church parking lot, and drop off some of the foods that Crossover could use to make sure that families are able to fully celebrate Thanksgiving this year. 
And they're looking this year, they're looking for canned green beans, for canned corn, for, for stuffing mixes and for gravy mixes and cake mixes. They're looking for, for cans of cranberry sauce. They don't want anything in glass jars, but if it's something that you find on the Thanksgiving table and it, it comes in a can, then they would, love, they would love our help in rounding up those items this year. So as you're doing your shopping in the next couple weeks, please, uh, please consider our neighbors. Think of, of the work that Crossover Downtown Outreach Ministry is doing and maybe pick up a few cans and, and swing by. It'll also give you a chance to stop by 225 West Court Street and, and to interact with some members of your church family. And these days, that's always, that's always a great gift and a blessing. Thank you to our friends at Crossover Downtown Outreach Ministry for doing such a good job of, of making sure that celebrations happen all around our community. Thank you, Court Street United Methodist Church, for supporting our ministry partners in the work that they do. And thank you. Thank you for doing the work that you do with the gifts that God has given you right where you are each and every day. Well, now we turn to a, a word from Scripture. This week we've invited somebody who's going to be very familiar to the youngest members of our church family, Chanel Simpson, to share with us a word, a reading from the Gospel of John. Listen now for God's voice as Chanel shares with us these words from Jesus. Hi guys, today's scripture reading is John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3 and verse 27. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you, take you to myself so that where I am, there will also be you. And then verse 27 reads, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. Thank you. Have a good Sunday. Well, a couple weeks ago, on a beautiful, sunny fall morning, I found myself at my office in the parsonage, getting ready for a graveside service for our friend Ron Krupenick. Now, the family had already had a celebration of Ron's life at the funeral home, and now everybody who knew and loved Ron was getting ready to gather at Evergreen Cemetery for a graveside service of interment. As I was getting ready that morning, I was feeling frustrated because it just didn't feel like the service was coming together. It felt like something was just a little bit off, and I couldn't figure out exactly what it was. Now, usually, these graveside services are, are pretty simple. You stand by the side of the grave, we say a few prayers, you say a few words about the person who's being laid to rest, you read a passage or two from scripture. At these graveside services, I almost always read the same passage or two from scripture. I love to read those, those passages from scripture that talk about planting seeds in the earth. You know, both Jesus and the Apostle Paul, as they talk about death and resurrection, give us the image of a seed being planted in the ground. Jesus, as he was teaching his disciples and teaching the crowds, said, listen, understand, people are like seeds. If you want to bear fruit, if you want to receive the new, the eternal life that God wants to give you, then we have to be planted in the earth like a seed. Only when we've been planted in the earth, only when we have died to this world can God work that transformation in us. People are like seeds, Jesus says. And the Apostle Paul also, as he's writing in his letters, says, listen, understand, people are like seeds. We plant these physical bodies in the ground. And then, far from where any human eye can see, God works an amazing transformation. God does what only God can do. And then, when God has done what God does, suddenly, one day, these physical bodies will spring up again from the earth like, like flowers in springtime, only we will see that, that they have been transformed into spiritual bodies, into something, into something completely new by the power of God's resurrecting love. People are like seeds, Paul says. People are like seeds, Jesus says. Almost always when we gather at the side of the grave in one of these moments of interment, I read either the words of Jesus or the words of Paul about planting seeds. But as I was getting ready a couple weeks ago for Ron Krupenick's graveside service, those readings just didn't feel right. As I was working on the service, I realized that the thing that felt off about the service was, was the reading that I had chosen. Because 
These readings are all about planting seeds and gardening and farming, but that really wasn't Ron's thing. Ron wasn't a gardener, he wasn't a farmer, he wasn't a planter of seeds. What Ron was, was a builder. As we were getting ready for the, the service, for the celebration of Ron's life, as I was talking to his children and learning about him, they, they talked to me about how Ron had built the home where they were raised. And they told me that Ron didn't just build the house and then leave it as it was. They said that Ron spent decades working on that house, tweaking things, adding room after room. They said the house was always a work in progress. There was always a, a hole in this wall over here or a board leaning against that wall over there. They said Ron, Ron made that house the work of a lifetime. He never stopped tinkering with it. And as they were, they were telling me about that, I realized that this, this image of Ron building this house, working on it for decades, adding room after room after room, reminded me of a passage of scripture. In the Gospel of John, we have the story of a conversation between Jesus and the disciples. Now the story goes that, that Jesus knew his ministry here on earth was drawing to a close. He knew that he was about to be betrayed, and abandoned, he was about to be crucified and laid in the tomb. And Jesus knew that, that all of these things would be difficult and scary for his disciples, and so he decided that he was going to prepare them for what they were about to live through. So he gathered them and they sat down at a table and shared a meal together. And as they were there at the table, Jesus began to, to tell them that their lives were about to change in a dramatic way. He said, listen, my ministry, my time on earth is coming to a close, Jesus said. Soon I'm going to go to the house of my father. And as Jesus is talking to the disciples, as he's sharing with them all of the things that are about to happen, he can see that the disciples begin to, to hyperventilate. He can see that they begin to feel anxious, that they start to panic. And the disciples say to Jesus, no, you can't do that, Jesus. You've got to stay with us. What will we ever do without you? Take us with you, Jesus, the disciples say. And Jesus sees the fear that's in their hearts in that moment. And so he speaks to them again. And this time he offers them words of comfort. There at the table, Jesus makes the disciples a promise. Jesus says, listen, in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. And some translations of the Bible, Jesus says, listen, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. In the old King James version of the Bible, Jesus said, listen, in my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus says, I will come again and I will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. Peace I leave with you, Jesus says. My peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. I love this moment in the Gospel of John. It's such a powerful moment. In this moment, Jesus makes, makes a promise to the disciples. He says, listen, I'm not leaving you forever. I'm going to my Father's house, not to get away from you, but so I can do some renovations. Jesus says, I'm gonna knock out some walls and I'm going to add some rooms. I'm going to add room after room after room until there is room in my Father's house for all of God's children. And then when my father's house is big enough for all of God's children, I will gather God's children together. I will take you to myself so that all of God's family can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love the image that Jesus gives his disciples in this moment. I love the image of Jesus, the eternal carpenter, rolling up his sleeves and working through the centuries to make God's house bigger and bigger, using all of the knowledge that he got from his earthly father, Joseph, about hammering nails and load-bearing walls. I love the image of Jesus working through the ages to make God's house bigger and bigger, adding room after room after room. That image made me think of our friend, Ron Krupenick. It made me think of the way that he kept adding room after room after room to his house. And Finally, that morning, a couple weeks ago, just as I was on my way out the door, I, I decided to do something that I almost never do. I decided to, to make a last minute change to the scripture reading. I decided to read this scripture that I almost never read at these graveside moments. I decided to drop and set aside these readings about planting seeds and instead to share this reading about building God's house and making it bigger. 
So I went to the cemetery and I found Ron's family waiting there for me by the side of the grave. And we did what we came there to do. We, we said a few prayers, we spoke a few words about Ron, and then I read this scripture reading about Jesus and building houses. And as I came to the very end of that scripture reading, as I shared those final words that Jesus spoke to his disciples, something happened. As I shared these words that Jesus said, peace I leave to you, my peace I give to you. Suddenly there was a, a sort of a stirring and a rustling among Ron's family and I noticed people nudging each other and, and elbowing each other. I knew that something had happened but I didn't know exactly what it was. I didn't find out what had happened until after the service was finished. And we had had the blessing and, and when the service was over, Ron's children, his son and his daughters came over to where I was standing and they said, listen, we need to tell you a story and we need to show you something. And so then they shared with me about their brother. They told me that they had had a brother, that Ron had had another son who died many decades ago when he was just a teenager, a, a son who died far too young. And they said that not long before their brother died, he had gone through the confirmation process at the church where they grew up and when he was confirmed as part of the confirmation process, he and all the other confirmation students were given a, a verse. They were assigned a sort of a life verse, something that they could carry with them out into the world, a verse from scripture that they could memorize that would give them strength and that would, would connect them to God in moments when they needed to be connected to God. And they said, our brother, he loved his verse. He took it to heart, he loved it so much that when he died, we had it engraved, we had it inscribed upon his, his grave marker, a grave marker that he now shares with his father. Now the whole time we had been standing there at the graveside, I was on, on the backside of the grave marker. And now Ron's children took me around to the other side of the grave marker where, where the whole family had been standing throughout the service. And they showed me the words that were engraved there on the, on the gravestone. As I looked down at that gravestone, I, I saw the, the very words that I had just spoken. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I got chills as I stood there in front of the grave looking at, at those words, those words that I had chosen at the last minute, the words that I hardly ever read at these graveside services. In that moment, it felt to Ron's children like a sign. And it felt to me like a sign. It felt like a sign that God was with us. It felt like a sign that even in moments of death, we can trust in Jesus. It felt like a sign that death is not the end of us, that God's love is more powerful than death and one day the people we love will be returned to us in the house of the Lord. It felt like a sign in a moment when we will take all of the signs of God's presence that we can get. In just a moment, we're gonna do the thing that we always do on All Saints Sunday. We're going to read a list of the names of those members of our church family who have died in the last 12 months. And as you hear these names, as you see these faces, I hope you know that it is okay for you to mourn. It's okay for you to grieve. It's okay for you to feel sad. Now, these people were, were our church family. They worshiped with us. They sang in the choir with us. They came to the Lord's table with us. They taught our Sunday school classes. They inspired us. They shaped our faith. They loved us and we loved them. And it is okay to grieve today. And it is okay to mourn. And as you hear these names and as you see these faces, I also hope that you will remember and hold in your heart the words of the Apostle Paul who reminded us that even as we mourn, we do not mourn as those who have no hope. We mourn as those who have been given a great hope. We mourn as those who believe in the promise Jesus made to us, that for every one of these saints, there is a room, there is a place in the house of the Lord, just as there is a room for you, just as there is a place for me. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Today we thank God for and commend to God's mercy and grace these saints 
whom we have loved. Andy Bentley. Frank Colvin. Ron Krupenick. Delmar Davis. Kathy Dick. Joan Durkee. David Hager. Betty Hamilton. Virginia Johnson. Ron Keller. Shirley Link. Betty Matura. Mike Orm. Gary Sanderson. Larry Wright. May their memory be a blessing. And may we meet again in the house of the Lord. Amen.
Well, in just a moment, I'm going to offer a word of blessing. Before the benediction, I want to invite you to stick around a little bit after worship today. Today is the first Sunday of the month, and so we're going to have a, a fellowship hour Zoom coffee time after worship today. The, the details on how to be part of that Zoom are in your church newsletter and also in an email that went out to our, our church family this last week. We would love for you to pop in. We're not good. We don't have anything on the agenda today other than just to see each other and hear each other's voices. And, and to support and encourage one another. So please stop in and say hello to your church family after, after worship today. Stay as long as you want. Leave when you're ready, just like we do as we, we drink coffee in this place during more, more normal times. I'm also going to invite you after the blessing to, to stick around right here on Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're watching and participating in this, this moment of worship this morning. Because after the blessing today, we're going to have an organ postlude from Alan Weimer, and of course, that's always a special treat. And during the organ postlude, you're gonna see a, a lot of names on your screen. Now, the names that you're about to see on your screen are the names of people who have left bequests and endowments to the Court Street United Methodist Church. These are the names of those saints who are still in ministry with us and among us, even though they are resting now in God's presence. People who planned for their ministry to continue after their lives on earth were ended. We are so grateful for the gifts that all of these people left to the Court Street United Methodist Church. We are able to weather this coronavirus storm in large part due to their generosity in years past. And we are able to, to do ministries and to care for people in ways that we wouldn't be able to do if they had not been who they were, if they had not given the gifts that they gave. And so I invite you to stick around and to enjoy the music and to read these names. And as you see each name come across your screen, take a moment to thank God for, for these people, some of whom maybe you knew, some of whom maybe you didn't know. Give thanks for these saints and the gifts that they gave and consider this morning Consider whether you might plan also for the future. Consider whether you might add your name to this list. Consider whether you want to make a gift to Court Street United Methodist Church that will be doing ministry years and decades and centuries into the future. All right, I invite you now to receive, to receive this word of blessing. May you mourn as those who have been given a great hope. And may the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with us always. Amen. Go in peace. You are deeply loved.